Hello everyone and welcome back. Now in the previous video, I introduced you to flows on the circle, right? This idea of moving a particle around in a circle. And we looked at a really simple example, the uniform oscillator, just constant movement around and around and around. But we also looked at a much more complicated example where you have this non-uniform oscillator and we saw that there's a saddle node bifurcation in the model. Now, in particular, that saddle node bifurcation led to a very interesting phenomenon that I was referring to as a bottleneck. Now, I want to interrogate that further in this short video, okay? And let me just remind you of some key facts, all right? So, remember, so let's say, let's recall, well, here's the model I had. So, hopefully you took some notes in the previous video. And... What we saw is that as A goes to omega, a saddle node, a SN, saddle node bifurcation takes place. Uh, bifurcation takes place. Okay, so in my case, I'm coming from the right. That is actually the two fixed points coming together, colliding and destroying each other. Right? So the particle, antiparticle. And what I want to show you is that, you know, another way of looking at these bottlenecks that we saw in the previous video is to think of them as sort of ghosts of the bifurcation, right? So as I said, I'm coming in from above, right? Where I had two fixed points and they come together and they collide at pi over two and then they annihilated each other. And what that means is that the floodgates are now open. I can go all the way around the circle completely unimpeded. But if I am slightly below omega with my a value, I'm going to see a little remnant of this bifurcation, and that is through a bottleneck. Okay, so remember, we saw this. We saw for a less than omega, the time to go around this, um, this uh, the circle time to wait, make one period of oscillation was given by, uh, let me just remind myself, there it is, two pi over the square root of omega squared minus a squared. All right, so we got this from a nice little integral formulation. And what we could actually do a little further is we could sort of open this up. So it would be two pi and then square root of omega plus a the square root of omega minus a. Now, this is what's causing the blow up, right? This thing is always positive given my values omega and a. And so it's this term, omega minus a, that's doing all the work. So what that gives me is what's called a square root singularity, square root blow up, square root scaling law. All of this is under the square root. So I approach that asymptote in a square root fashion. What I want to show you is that this is typical, actually, not just the model that I looked at. But in particular, let's take a look at what the graph of theta would look like here. Okay, so my graph of theta would look like this. Let's say I'm gonna go uh, this is T. Let's say I'm going to go from, let's say, minus pi down here. Okay, so I know that maybe you don't like that I didn't put zero in the corner, uh, but uh, that's okay. I'm still going to do it. And let's go from minus pi to pi, right? So complete one period of oscillation in this case. Uh, and we also know that the the sort of ghost or the bottleneck happens close to pi over two. So what is it that we would see? We would see fast approach up to the bottleneck and then this really, really, really long, slow molasses period. And then once you get through the, the molasses, you get this fast snapping back. So again, here's my phase line diagram. The only thing that happens is you're going around in a circle over and over and over again. When you get from to pi, this thing just resets and goes back to minus pi. And we know that it's fast down here and it's slow up here. 
and this is the pi over two. So it's this thing right here where I see the bottleneck. There it is, right there. So the question is, is this typical, right? Do I see it in all kinds of models or is, did I just happen to pick a really specific one? Well, in fact, this is extremely typical of saddle node bifurcations. These ghosts appear all over the place. So we can actually write this as a general scaling law. And what I mean by that is that this square root behavior that I just showed you up here, the square root of the blow up, is always going to be found when you have saddle node bifurcations. So how? Well, near a saddle node bifurcation, we can change variables into the normal form. Right? We've seen this before. It's really just like a Taylor expansion and a little bit of rescaling. But that means that close to a saddle node bifurcation, we can always write things that look like this. We've seen it before, right? The normal form sort of governs all of the saddle node bifurcations that take place under very sort of minor assumptions, right? Basically, all you need is a quadratic singularity. And so even in this model, you can see the same type of thing that we saw previously with the phase model. And that is the bottleneck comes from this little wedge right in here, right? So this is the bottleneck. So even if we haven't done any work yet, you can kind of see the bottleneck taking place. When R is positive, you get this little region in here where you, don't, you, you haven't seen a bifurcation take place yet. You gotta, your, your velocity slows way, way, way down. It's really close to zero down here. That's the bottleneck again. And in fact, we can figure out or we can approximate the time spent in the bottleneck. So time spent in bottleneck. Okay, so again, I'm gonna do it for the normal form. I already computed it right here for my, um, for my phase model. Let's actually do it with the normal form. And why for the nor normal form? Remember, it's always going to govern anything where saddle node bifurcation takes place. All I need to do is reframe how I look at it. So by doing it for the normal form, you're doing it for every saddle node bifurcation that takes place. Well, the time you spend in the bottleneck, this is basically, it is going to be, so remember this was zero to T uh, and then DT. I did the sort of same thing for the phase model here. Once you skip a few steps, you get DX over the right hand side of the differential equation. And in this case, now I'm not sort of, in a, because I'm in the normal form case, I'm back on the line, I'm going to integrate from minus infinity to infinity, okay? So this is a sort of, uh, a little bit of a generalization, but it just makes the integration work well. So with this approximate here, right, it's not exact, but I'm trying to sort of show you how this comes up. Because you can easily compute this thing Again, you might need some trigonometric integration, uh, but this gives you pi over the square root of r. And again, you see the square root scaling. So square root scaling. There it is again, right? In this case, my bifurcation takes place when r is equal to zero. Over here, my bifurcation took place when omega is equal to a. So it's the same thing, they're just viewed in a different context. So how is it that I could actually do this viewing in a different context? Well, let's just work through it. I wanna show you that every bottleneck is exactly this right here. All you have to do is look at it the right way. So let's return to our phase model. All right, so I've got theta dot, is equal to omega minus a sine of theta. 
I'm going to recast this thing into the normal form and I'm going to show you to get the same square root scaling law. Okay. So I'm going to do a Taylor expansion. So Taylor about, I'm going to do it where I get slow. So Taylor about theta equal to pi over two, All right? That's where the bottleneck takes place. That's where the saddle node bifurcation takes place. So I want to do it by saying let, let's introduce the Greek letter phi in this case to be the variable that is centered around pi over two. Okay, so I need to recenter my frame of reference on the circle here. It's just a sort of rotation of the circle. And this gives me that the differential equation for phi dot is just equal to omega minus a sine of phi plus pi over two. Again, just rearrange this thing and substitute. Nothing fancy, right? Although it looks, it looks complicated sometimes, it's really not that complicated. Now, actually I can fix this with a trigonometric identity. When you add pi over two to uh, the argument of a sine, that just becomes a cosine. So this actually becomes a cos Now I want to do a Taylor expansion, right? So omega minus a cos, again, phi is around zero because theta is around pi over two. So cos of zero is one. So that gives me a, and then I get the quadratic term, one half a phi squared. And as always, I ignore the higher powers. Cosine is an even function. So the next one up is to the four. It's not to the three. Let's do some rescaling. Let's have a little bit of fun. Let's let x equal to a over two to the square root times phi. Okay, so new independent variable again. First thing I did was I, I shifted. Now I'm going to rescale. I'm gonna stretch it or compress it. And I'm going to let r equal to omega minus a. Right? This is my bifurcation piece right here. I'm moving around uh, A in order to hit omega. And so what this gives me is it gives me 2 over A to the 1 half times X dot is equal to R plus X squared plus order X to the 4. So it's basically the normal form. The only difference is I have this annoying coefficient out front. So this actually gives me x dot is equal to a over two to the one half and then times r plus a over two to the one half x squared plus order x to the four. If you really wanna get rid of that a over two to the one half, you can just rescale time but now you can just do the same computation I just did. You can say T bottleneck. Again, we've seen it before. So this is going to be, so once you factor this out, it's gonna be two over A to the one half. And then the integral from minus infinity to infinity, DX over R plus X squared the normal form. And then this gives me two over a to the one half and I get times pi over the square root of r. I already did this computation right here. And again, I get the square root blow up, right? So if I substitute uh, r equal to omega minus a, this implies that T bottleneck is uh, approximately equal to, pardon me, well, I get uh, the square root of two times pi divided by the square root of uh, omega, I'll, I'll explain that in just a second, and then times one over the square root of omega minus a. 
And why did I put an omega right here? Well, that's because A is basically equal to omega. Remember, I'm very, very close to the bifurcation point. Otherwise, this wouldn't make any sense. So A and omega are very, very close to each other. But this is just a number. Who cares? Doesn't bother me at all. What bothers me or what makes me interested is the square root scaling. That is a ghost of a saddle node bifurcation. They're everywhere, right? So even though there's no fixed points, we still get a sense of when a, a saddle node bifurcation would be taking place. So if you start seeing graphs that look like this, where you get this long sort of bottleneck, it's typically a precursor to a saddle node bifurcation. So I urge you to take any model where you found a saddle node bifurcation and try and do these computations, try and find these bottleneck periods. It always looks like this. It might be some junky numbers out front, but it's always that square root uh, according to where the bifurcation takes place. So that means that the length of the bottleneck, the time you spend in the bottleneck, it increases like one over the square root of going to the bifurcation value. Really, really cool stuff, really, really fun stuff. Uh, you know, and, and just great names, ghosts and bottlenecks. But these are extremely important for physical scenarios uh, that we encounter when we're sort of doing these models, especially on the circle where you see this fast and slow oscillation going around and around and around. All right, in the next video, we're going to do a fun little application to fireflies.